Bitcoin is close to becoming worthless. Now, what's the Bitcoin? The Bitcoin's like rat poison. Yeah. Oh. The greatest scam in history. Let's get it. Bitcoin will go to fucking zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, you ungovernable misfits. I'm your host, Max. Everybody knows that Bitcoin is useless, worthless, and doomed to fail. But what if everyone's wrong? What if it's the system that is doomed to fail? Join me as I speak to some of the brightest people in the space and slither to the deepest, darkest depths of the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Welcome back, everyone. Today's episode is with Nick the founder of Bitcoin Reserve. I had a really good conversation with Nick. Sadly, half of it was off air because we had a little bit of a technical issue where we kept dropping out. You can't hear it because I've recorded locally, but I was just losing sort of 10% of what he was saying and having to string it together. And it was a little bit frustrating, but nonetheless, really, really enjoyed this one. And I think you're going to as well. Before we dive in, I want to say thank you to CoinFloor UK for sponsoring the show. If you are in the UK and you are looking to dollar cost average, pound cost average, you can do that with their service. They've been around for a long time. They've got a great team. If you are going to go through a KYC exchange, definitely use a good one. And they are the only one I recommend in the UK. Next up is Crypto Cloaks. Crypto Cloaks, you all know from Twitter. They have such a cool team. They're putting out some amazing products. They have the block mitt. They have personalized node cases and much, much more. Make sure to check them out. They are Bitcoin only and they are CryptoCloaks.com. Enjoy the show. Hi, Nick. Sorry about that. I don't know what was happening. You seem to be in the green room for, uh, <laughs> for an age. Quite all right, Max. How are you? Yeah, really well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well as well, uh, enjoying the sunshine off the Adriatic coast currently. Oh, wow, beautiful. Where, whereabouts, or you don't want to dox yourself too much? Yeah, perhaps we'll save that for another time. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. You got some time away from work or uh, just working from a laptop? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been a digital nomad for quite some time. This is currently the region where I personally see as being the most favorable considering the conditions that are predominant in the in the world today. Mm. Yeah, well we'll get into some of these conditions a little bit later cuz um yeah, it's it's crazy crazy times, but um as we haven't spoken yet, we've uh, it's the first time we've we've chatted even from off air as well. I thought it'd be really cool to get a little bit of a rundown on what it is that you're doing and uh and a little bit of a background on the bitcoin reserve why it started nish has told me a little bit but yeah for the listeners could you give a little bit of a rundown on on how it started and uh what you guys are aiming to be doing yeah absolutely so i'll kind of start with myself and i think it will naturally lead into where the business is today Um, My background is economics and finance, and uh, I've been following the markets ever since kind of high school equities, Forex, that kind of stuff. Um, At that point in time, I would akin it more to gambling rather than trading, to be honest. But (laughs) it it really was a a passion of mine. And I Mm -hmm. came across Bitcoin in late 2012. Actually, I originally came about it in 2011, but at that time, I didn't think much of it. I had heard of eGold, and I didn't think that this was going to be much different. However, in 2012, my friend really prodded me and said, hey, you know what, just just read the white paper, take a look, see what you think. So I took the dive, and I started to realize the paradigm shift that could actually be upon us. And I still didn't know whether it was going to be successful, but the fact that you could securitize energy and make that as a means of store of value that that was something to me that well hadn't existed before and frankly the security system in place how everything worked from a mining perspective 
also differentiated in my mind. But to me, you know, again, my origin being trading, I definitely dove into it because of the possibility of a completely new marketing opening up. So if you're into trading or anybody who's listening is, you know, that in the retail space, there's something called the Bloomberg terminal. And the Bloomberg mm-hmm. terminal gives you access to certain data that the average retail investor might not necessarily get. So this is the order book depth and some other metrics. Well, this data was readily available just as is as a result of uh, the platforms that Bitcoin was traded on at that time, um, on Gox being the predominant one. So to me as a trader, I was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to watch a market get born from absolutely nothing uh, mm-hmm. in its infancy. That's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And uh, that carried forward and I started to fall deeper in love with the space itself and uh, I started to travel around to the various Bitcoin meetups. Um, back in the day, I met with um, Paul Pui. Uh, he's now running Edge, which used to be called Airbits. And that was at the conference in Vegas, I believe. Uh, from there, you know, again, the individuals involved in projects such as his, as well as others, really opened my eyes to the possibilities of what can be. And then from there, I was like, you know what? I think this is going to be my full-time thing. So I I threw myself into the technology. I threw myself into the business world. Um, Through there, I worked at an exchange in Vancouver. Uh, I set up an AIF in Liechtenstein with with a couple of uh, extra Wall Street guys, which did not go in the way that I was expecting. (laughs) The 2018 crypto winter hit as well. It was a lot of moments fun. So (laughs) that that wasn't uh, the most ideal setup, let's put it that way. But it gave me an incredible opportunity to look at the regulatory infrastructure behind all this, and especially in areas where... Well, frankly, there actually was regulation that was relatively clear and and understood. And of course, met with the individuals there. From that point forward, um, actually, I had gotten back together with Yuri, who is the founder of Bitcoiners over alongside myself. And he was working at a private brokerage firm in Vancouver at the time. So we got a talking and we said, you know what? We've, We've both had some experience in the past that we might not necessarily want to build off of but the opportunities and the things that we have understood from those experiences should help us build a successful business at that Mm -hmm. time he had a bit of a client list and i had uh, an incredible amount of knowledge with regards to infrastructure setup from various areas uh, geographically speaking from there we said okay you know what let's let's give it a try let's try uh, bitcoin only otc brokerage by the way through my entire career i i was more or less focused in Bitcoin, I dabbled into the shit coins, uh, yeah, not, not proud to say, but <laughs> we all do it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've all had that itch, right? Um, yeah. uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, we, Yuri and myself, we decided that the thing that we wanted to do was build a business that was going to stand the test of time, really. And mm-hmm. Bitcoin was the first and foremost thing that allowed us to have this vision for the company for what we wanted to construct. Uh, Alongside of that, we shopped around extensively for various regions and uh, regulators that would be compliant with this long term. Because Bitcoin Reserve uh, at that time called Layer 2 Brokers OU um, is a business that we want to be here for decades on end. It's, it's, you know, we've experienced in our past all of those businesses that fly high and uh, do a bunch of stuff that isn't really helping them be them, helping them have staying power and as a result uh, like i mentioned we, we did an extensive search for jurisdiction we settled on uh, being in estonia and we started the otc desk the otc desk had some clients from yuri's book and as we continued on into the business we really wanted to bring the value of what bitcoin had to offer to not just high net worth individuals because it, as the pandemic hit especially and everything started to change very rapidly in the world, we saw a increasing need for individual sovereignty and financial autonomy. And that needed to be delivered to not just people that uh, are perhaps you know in a certain echelon of the economic system, but everyone. So from there, we decided to uh, launch our retail product, which is Flash Trade. We just got that up and running about a week and a half ago. And it's essentially an automated uh, OTC desk, if you will, uh, for Mm -hmm. individuals to buy Bitcoin. And we don't hold any custody, not your keys, not your coins. We're firm believers in that. 
from our own experiences, <laughs> and yeah. not just uh, from a business perspective. And kind of here we are today. So I, I, I'd love to get into any detail, or if you have any questions on any specifics of the journey, please. Yeah, well, a, a few. So I mean, firstly, it's, uh, it seems a lot of people choose Estonia. And my my question is like, what is it that particularly makes it so favorable in terms of regulation? Because regulation is something that you know, I talk about a lot on this show, uh, I feel it stifles innovation in many ways, it causes a lot of issues to to Bitcoin and, and people trying to build businesses. And it's, it seems to be a constant cat and mouse game, trying to sort of comply enough that you can serve customers, but not too much so that you ruin their privacy completely and and so that you cause yourself a headache and can't operate in the way that you want is it that estonia is kind of a more lenient country that allows you to be a little bit more innovative or or is it uh, something else well first and foremost i'll kind of bring it back to when we were looking to set up the fund and we looked at various jurisdictions uh, from singapore to south america to Isle of Man, Estonia, Liechtenstein, all over the place. And the majority of the answers that we got when we spoke to the legal teams there that were supposedly experts in their field was, well, you know what? You can kind of do what you want at this point. There's no firm groundwork, but in the next two to five years, we can't guarantee that you won't be going to jail. It's like, oh, okay. Um, that's <laughs> that's that's a bit of a of a of a turn, and as a result, uh, we started to realize that what was necessary was we need a defined framework within which to operate in. Whether that same framework, you know, is in country A or country B, is less relevant than a clear understanding and the ability to interact with the regulators on a very, uh, not only just personal, but kind of an efficient basis. So if, if you're talking about the regulators in the United States, I mean, I don't know if anybody has tried here to set anything up, but you have to first go through all the 50 state regulators, then you have to contact, whether it be the SEC or um, the other regulatory agencies, and the response times are months, months and months. Mm. Um, whereas countries such as Liechtenstein and Estonia in particular, well, in Liechtenstein, you can literally go to their office, <laughs> knock on their door, have a face to face and a similar oh, really? situation. Yeah. Similar situation in Estonia as well. So from there, it's the efficiency of communication that really, um, I think allowed us to make that definitive choice. And when you add the fact that Estonia has e-residency, which us being digital nomads allowed us to control and operate the company from outside of the actual geographic region of Estonia. Mm -hmm. That was the one of the biggest advantages in Liechtenstein. Unfortunately, there's nothing like that. So you have to get fiduciaries to do everything for you. Um, and that becomes a very cumbersome and expensive process over time. So that's primarily the reason why we settled on that jurisdiction. And I'll, I'll address your point of regulation in general. Personally, what we are trying to accomplish here and what I've always uh, thought about regulation is that there needs to be a basic understanding between the regulators and the industry. And then through those communications, and hopefully they are effective communications, then there could be something developed which allows progression, but doesn't necessarily open up the space to abuse from nefarious parties which during the ico craze i mean you that that was the oh, epitome yeah. of abuse right <laughs> so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you, you need to take those people and make sure that they have a harder time doing what they do while still allowing a business that wants to legitimately operate a framework to do so um but the reality you know that's that's a nice thing to think but the reality of the situation is that regulators often over regulate they stifle innovation and companies tend to jump any jurisdictions that have a heavy hand in this regard. So mm. again, that comes back to our ability to communicate directly, for example, with the IFIU and the Estonia, which is our regulator, and get really quick uh, feedback on whether something is appropriate or not, or whether it will work in the long term. So that's, that's where we're really headed to. And again, is being able to form these relationships, which will bring us 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the line whatever jurisdiction that uh, we have so chosen. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, I like that you said you, you're taking the, the long approach on this. It's a low time preference thinking and you want to be around for a long time. You know, that's what I've seen with a lot of exchanges. And like you're saying, with this ICO craze and all that sort of crazy times, you just had a load of nutters just coming in abusing everyone and then and then disappearing and and also just you know even even the big uh, companies and you know a lot of people don't call them out but people like coinbase and some of these they really fucking annoy me because it's it's like they get people in the door with something fantastic they had you know they say oh we've got bitcoin and people come for bitcoin and it's a chance for people to really have some real sovereignty and and have something mm-hmm. that really can change the world and then they dump a load of shit on them they confuse them and and have you know 50 different shit coins all with basically no use and it really irritates me because you get such a small percentage of the population who will even think to look into something like this and they have the opportunity to do well and then just at that last minute the people who are supposed to be looking after them are dumping on them and uh yeah so that that was nice to hear that it, it sounds like um you are bitcoin focused and that it is a long-term play and, and that you want to be there for your customers which is cool yeah i mean it's, it's funny that you mentioned coinbase and uh, shit coins in general if if you look at what the business model is of most of these icos and it's it's incredibly disingenuous what you tend to have is an originating group of creators, if you will, and their financiers. With those, they usually create uh, what is known as a SAFTA agreement, uh, which is a, a version of the SAFE agreement that was created um, by Silicon Valley uh, incubator, I believe. And with that, those investors pile in, right? They pile in early, and with that, they go and they create basically a white paper. Again, this was back in uh, 2017, 2018. It's a bit more difficult now, I assume, but. Um, nonetheless, with that money in hand, they go and they literally shop it around to various exchanges. Uh, exchanges, I, I remember back in the day, they had it just a fee. Okay, million bucks for listing your coin, 500000 for <laughs> listing your coin, whatever the case is. You pay it, we list it, that gets liquidity, and then you do your ICO. As soon as you do your ICO and you do the public offering, that's literally when the people that got in early with the SAFT agreements liquidate. And then they mm-hmm. do it again, and they rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And this is this is the reason, actually, why Ethereum shot up early on in 2017 is because that was the only way that you could participate. It was yeah. not possible for those companies to get banking relationships because, well, <laughs> it's unregulated security. And yeah. uh, the only way you could do it was through Ethereum. So people bought Ethereum regardless of the price because they knew they could flip it in these types of private circles. And the exchanges are complacent in it. And they were just pushing this onto the unwilling public who just saw you know insane amounts of returns very very quickly but then have the rug pulled from under them so you know i'm I'm not a fan at all of that type of disingenuity within the ecosystem and that is one of the other reasons why we focus on bitcoin and bitcoin only because it allows truly for something to be delivered from us to the individual that's not just a product It, it is you know for lack of a better word, financial freedom and autonomy, especially what's going to be happening with central bank digital currencies, um, the surveillance states that's uh, befalling us and then the world at large. Financial sovereignty is going to be one of the most important topics, I believe, of this century. I, I completely agree with you. It's certainly why I'm here. It's, it's not why I originally came here i came here because i saw something going up in value and i thought oh wow i'm going to be rich <laughs> you know and uh, <laughs> it, it drew me in and that, that's just being honest is it was completely about the money and then you know as you stay here for longer and you see the innovation you see the people who are working in this and you start to understand what a massive impact this can have on the world it's pretty damn addictive and impossible to do anything else do you remember a time when you know you said you were you were there in the beginning and seeing this new market emerge and that was what was fascinating to you are there specific points that you can remember along your journey where you just sort of stopped and thought okay no this is this is more than i thought it was or or things that really hit you and changed your view on the world yeah and i wish i could take credit for these revelations but in all honesty they came from the community I myself was just like you. I saw a number go up and it fit with my trading model at the time. 
and I saw good returns and I used those returns to meet amazing people. And I think that's really when my perspective started to shift, right? You, you had a lot of the libertarian crowd that was mixed into it. And, you know, I, I, I like to stick away from that label because I, I don't think it's very appropriate, but individuals who are focused on self-sovereignty and freedom and mm -hmm. those who are truly trying to establish themselves as global citizens within the world. When I started to interact with those individuals, that's when I think my mind started to change as to wait a second, how can this particular technology and its ability to carry value through time, despite what's going on in the global financial ecosystem, how can that truly impact me as a citizen of the world? And what does that provide anybody else here? And when I started to address those questions, that's when I had that aha moment. And I, I can't pin it to any one particular interaction. It was almost as if um, you're filling up a glass drip by drip, and then all of a sudden the glass mm. just overflows. And when it overflows, that's when you go, aha. But was it the last drop or was it the first one? It's, it's hard to judge because they're all kind of coming from a lot of different places. That's a good way of putting it, actually. Yeah, it, it is It is like that. And it's, it seems that's a common theme of like most people that I speak to have, have a similar feeling. It's like, yeah, I can't really put my finger on it. It's just, it, it's, it's a really good way of putting it, a, a drop in a glass and you don't know when it goes. But when it goes, it's just mind blowing. And you're like, <laughs> holy yeah. shit, I've just stumbled across something that is so big. And, and just so important that I, I don't know if you're the same like every day I get up now like hyped I'm just like right the, I'm part of something that is going to change the world I'm doing something that is so exciting and like previously I was so bored like with all the work that I was doing and I thought oh like didn't the 60s look cool didn't the 70s look cool didn't the 80s look cool wasn't it cool when not everything was so regimented and boring and people working in offices and everything seemed corrupt around me and everything just seemed like oh, everything's just getting worse I'm bored and then this hit and it's like completely the other way it's it's just like yeah, the most exciting thing. I, I couldn't wish to be born in a, in a better time. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I feel that so many people, and myself included, back in the day was focused on, well, for lack of a better term, the rat race itself. And that provides no value to yourself internally. It doesn't feed your soul. Uh, but I feel that what mm. you're doing here actually has a effect on the future, a realistic change that we can provide mm. this opportunity for people to, well, grab hold of whatever wealth they have now and perhaps even generate more in the future and carry it through generations. Like this, this is not just for me, this is for my children. This is for their children's children. I mean, this is something that is uh, fundamentally different from an economic perspective than the world has had in a very, 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 very long time. I mean, we always talk about the similarities between gold and Bitcoin. Um, I think there's definitely a lot to draw upon here, but what advantages Bitcoin does have over gold in particular is its ability to be a modern version and one that is transmutable across time and space instantly. That, mm. that right there, that value capture and that proposition is so incredibly powerful when you have to consider that in this day and age of social surveillance and where we're going with the bio, um, the bio digital paradigm where you have the self, the human self merging with the digital self, you are going to come to a point in time where your presence online is going to dictate what and you what you can and cannot spend your money on because that's mm -hmm. going to form an ecosystem where you're going to have merchants who have to either pass or not pass certain regulatory frameworks in order to be able to be on that payment system. So effectively what you're doing is you're creating financial censorship through that infrastructure. And Bitcoin is your escape. It is your mm -hmm. escape, it is your ticket out. And providing that to people and waking up knowing that, yeah, yes, like that's, that's actually what we're doing here. Yeah, I, I wake up with a smile. Uh, at least on days that I don't see some crazy shit news in the morning about this or that. It's, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> Absolutely. And and like you were saying, like the people that you get to meet in this industry, firstly, they're like completely different to everyone that you meet in uh, traditional systems. They're just, uh, they're freedom lovers. They're thinking outside the box. They're, there's just a certain vibe with, with something about meeting Bitcoiners and speaking to Bitcoiners where you're just like, oh, this person gets me. We're on the same page. You know, there's the infighting and lots of uh, crazy shit that goes on in the Bitcoin world as well. But this freedom loving aspect and for someone like you who you know you've said you're a digital nomad so you're you're already sort of living in the future you are far ahead of the the curve ahead of the trend because this is what i think if we can get rid of this whole covid bullshit stuff that's going on and and all the craziness and everyone can just wake the fuck up what will happen is more and more people will go towards that lifestyle more and more people will think well what am what am I doing? Like being tied to one location where there's a beautiful world out there. There's so many different cultures, so many different people, so many things to see. And to be able to take your wealth, you know, you're talking about gold uh, having similarities with Bitcoin and uh, and the differences there. But you know, one massive thing is just you try and walk across a border with a bar of gold <laughs> you know yeah. how, how quickly are you going to be stopped and arrested and interrogated and you know how quickly are your freedoms going to be taken from you whereas if you are to have bitcoin and you're smart about it you can go anywhere in the world and you can take your wealth with you and sec- and you can take it securely and that is like a dream i imagine for a digital nomad yeah, absolutely. And there's a really good song. It's by uh, Bitcoin Baron. I, I highly suggest you guys look it up, uh, whoever's listening. I, I think it was released in mm. 2014. And one of the lines from the song, I got my whole net worth in my laptop bag. And that is very, very true. Oh, yeah. And it's it's so advantageous, I believe, in this day and age where you have to look for work in not just your geospatial area, uh, basically not your kind of like your backyard or your city, but you have to look wider uh, to what connects us all currently. And that is the internet. And it's trying mm-hmm. to find a way to be able to transact freely within that ecosystem, I think is just as important as the type of work that you end up doing. Absolutely. And do you have any kind of tools or projects that you're particularly fond of um, in terms of securing? And, you know, you said you you guys don't hold people's bitcoin you you make sure that they hold their own keys as someone who is uh, moving around and, and living as a digital nomad are there any projects uh you know node packages or hardware wallets or software wallets or mixing services or anything that you you particularly like at the moment yeah our our our, our predominant uh, i guess my, my personal preference and I don't want to kind of go too deep into the weeds from a business perspective, but Coal Card, Electrum, no, of course, and yeah. Trezors. Those, those are some of our favorite devices. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned one interesting thing, and that's mixers. Here, I'll give everybody a bit of an understanding of how the regulatory framework is currently constructed. And this might help people in the future navigate to these ecosystems and exchanges uh, that have to comply with certain standards and abide by KYC and AML regulation. So back in 2017, 2018, roughly, that is when I, I should say, yeah, early 2017, I was actually at an incubator in in Vancouver. And I happened to talk with a couple of guys and the name escapes me of the company right now, but they eventually sold their tech to a three-layer agency. Um, that's all the kind of they could share at that point in time. But it was blockchain analytics, it was specifically focused on being able to understand the routing of uh, transactions. And I, I remember him opening up his laptop and kind of showing me this gigantic web. And he's like, "Oh, you know, here's here's a dark market one. Uh, here's uh, an, another exchange. Here's you know some wallet that's unknown. And then they can essentially track heuristically. And here's the key: heuristically." Right, mm-hmm. uh, whether or not these coins are considered tainted, or whether they're legitimate, whether they're fresh virgin coins, even though there's not really technically such a thing. And I asked him, like, well, what, like, what do you, what do, you, what do you do with this information? He's like, honestly, to us, it's it's absolutely useless. There's so many ways that you can get around this, but for some reason, 
the three letter agencies are very fond of this and they want they want our software so, so okay uh, i guess they were going ahead and, and providing them with, with that particular piece and as a result some of the regulators particularly banks in particular actually required this as a barrier or if you will as as a precursor to opening an account with them now in reality that is simply a result of the onboarding and the compliance process in practice first and foremost people don't do not often recycle bitcoin addresses okay even mm -hmm. we ourselves simply because of how our infrastructure is set up every single time there is a transaction that is done it's always going to a new address um, that's mm -hmm. not even necessarily for NetSec purposes. It's just a result of how some of the technology works. Just good practice. Yeah, yeah, right. And from there alone, <laughs> when you try to do analytics and they say, "Oh, can you please provide, you know, this uh, this wallet address uh, uh, that we can whitelist?" And we always go back and say, "But you realize that we have hundreds, thousands of addresses. We don't have one address that you can whitelist." It doesn't work that way and they just they, they they don't comprehend it they're like we just need it we just mm. need it just to put a check mark in a little box <laughs> and that's what i want to get to at the end of the day is that this is all that they're doing right now is just putting check marks in boxes in order to communicate this information in a coherent manner and in a way that we wanted to if we were to go in that direction to be compliant with a regulator who requests that they would need to have a technical understanding on the other side of what that information means and the fact that these are probabilistic heuristics of connectivity of point a to point b and not a direct linkage of oh this is terrorist money <laughs> you know <laughs> or some bullshit term like that and they just they, they don't have it so the the entire ecosystem as it stands from a blockchain analytics perspective is a complete farce if you ask mm -hmm. me it's just it's 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 just all check boxes on somebody's excel sheet and that's it now whether that's going to change or not in the future i don't know so to those individuals who are particularly trying to investigate privacy aspects and how to really try to increase that within their own transactional capabilities um, i would say that know that when that is requested from whatever third party that you are dealing with that it is highly unlikely that is actually going to effectively change anything with regards to your account standing. Now, this is you know not financial advice in any way, shape, mm -hmm. or form. We're not financial advisors. That disclosure, blah blah blah. Uh, I know even this can be construed as such at times, but it's it's more of an understanding that these technologies that we have, including mixers, are so far ahead of mm -hmm. what the regulators can even understand if they wanted to that it, it sometimes is going one step too far to do it, then you're just putting yourselves into the crosshairs of a system that is going to just label you as a bad actor simply by a program that uses a heuristical association, right? And it's like, you would be better off actually just not using it, going and doing that service, and you would have more ingrained security, if you will, than if you were to do that and go through a mixer. So it's like, as soon as you onboard and into that ecosystem, uh, unfortunately you get put in with a basket of other not so positively associated transactions. Let's put it that way. So yeah, that's that's my long story on, <laughs> on mixers. Mm. I personally, I mix everything. And there's a few reasons that I do it. One is the idea of whitelist, blacklist, uh, these regulators believing that they can come in and control this thing that is a revolution and, and is going to provide privacy and freedom to individuals all around the world. I like to be part of whatever group they put to one side because fuck them. They have no place here. Also, I don't want people to know my amounts and I don't want people to be able to track things back. And although, like you said, you know, these regulators and these banks and all the people who are coming in are so far behind, um, what is on chain is on chain forever. And so right. everything I have, I, I, I personally like Samurai Wallet. I use, uh, I use Whirlpool. I think it's very, very good. And uh, from my understanding, from like OXT research, etc., they basically just take this bundle and they just put it to one side and just go, well, we know a load of people went in. We don't know who came out. 
we just put it to one side because if we put this in, it's just going to actually cause issues and, and make any of these assumptions that we have so difficult to guess that it's going to actually make everything else even more difficult to understand. So they just put it off to one side. But I understand it. And I think everyone has to take these uh, everyone has to make their own decisions and there's a lot of people who will be adamant one way or one way or the other but it comes down to personal preference and sort of what people are here for and it sounds really childish but a, a huge part of why I'm here is just being able to put a middle finger up and say fuck mm-hmm. you because the the people who were in control of the money and well still are in control of the money and still are in control of all the rules and all of the, all of the things that uh, control us and enslave us as humans they've really abused our trust they've really taken the piss they've really caused issues for for billions of people on this planet and all i want is to see their power gone all i want is to see them no longer have control and to have this system which is fair and true to be what is in control and what people use and completely strip out these middlemen but there is this weird time as we transition to this new world where there's like a clash of the libertarians and the anarchists and the the people who want the freedom and then there's the businesses that are sort of in between who have to be in between them and they have to be in between regulators and then on the other side there are the regulators and so it it just gets messy you know and it's going to be messy probably for a long time but um, there's so much information out there that people need to do their research work out what it is they want from this system and, and then act accordingly. That's very well said. And I think you hit upon a more general context that I see evolving as it comes to just having your own privacy with your transactional history and everything technically being well on an open public ledger. And that is we are transitioning to a time where there is going to be two economies. And I'm not just talking about the Bitcoin economy and then the fiat economy. I'm talking about an economy that actually includes everything, including digital currencies and centrally backed digital currencies that are completely under the purview of the current purveyors of the systems. And this is actually going to include Bitcoin. So if you right now see some of the regulation going out uh, in the United States, banks can now hold your Bitcoin, Mm -hmm. but they hold your keys. So Mm -hmm. it's not really your money. And this type of narrative, I feel, is being pushed further and further to the average individual where Bitcoin is bad. But if you're going to buy it, buy it from us and store it with us. And Mm -hmm. that's clearly one ecosystem that is going to exist and continue to grow while you have another ecosystem that's forming around freedom, around transactional capability without borders and intermediaries. And that requires a certain amount of technical aptitude at this point in time to interact with, right? So as as you mentioned, there are several technologies which you can utilize currently. And if you do know that you then exactly like you said, are already put into a basket, right? So when you're doing these transactions, you have to understand that that is what's happening. You are choosing a side effectively. And by all means, know what you're doing and be accepting of it. And that's kind of, I think the, 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 the main point here is you have to know the results of your actions, the repercussions of what you do. And there's going to be a time where it might be appropriate to do that. And there's going to be a time where it might be less appropriate to do that. But having that knowledge is the power. And you know what we're trying to provide, exactly as you said, as a company that's kind of stuck in between this middle ground is this connection between the legacy and the future and trying to make it as simple and as effective as possible for people to be able to make their own decisions. That's really what we're trying to provide. And then Mm -hmm. what they do after the fact, we can only hope and encourage uh, a free and innovative society. But at the end of the day, it's up up to the individual themselves. Hey, Max, uh, I might have lost you there. Hopefully I'm not hosting the show by myself at this point. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, oh, sorry. Yeah. It keeps it keeps cutting out. It's it's done it from the beginning, but I, I, I get sort of 
ninety percent of what you're saying, and I can fill in the, I can fill in the gaps. But there, it just cut out for like ten seconds. I lost you at being in the middle, helping on board people in in the most simple way, and and I, th- I think I got most of what you're saying. So I agree. I think um, it's really important that people have access to onboard themselves and do it in a simple way and once people do that then they can then they can start to research then they can start to learn but the simple truth is that if people don't hold any bitcoin yet they are way less likely to bother doing a deep dive and actually learning it's such a massive incentive once you see oh i've got x amount of bitcoin and, and actually, you, you tend to think in dollars or euros and think, oh, I've got this much. And you watch that go up and down. Adverse. You don't initially. Yes, exactly. You don't initially think, oh, how many sats have I got? But but given time, that is such a massive incentive because you once you especially see uh, the value go up, then you're like, oh, my God, the value's gone up. I need to learn more. Oh, I've lost you again. Uh, I lost you again there. I, I can hear you. Yeah, value go up. Okay, yeah. And that's it. And so that's why it's so important to have uh, have companies like yours where you're making it simple for people, making it possible and accessible for people. And so when you think about that, what is your approach in terms of UX, in terms of support? Um, how do you how do you think about making this simple for people and making it secure for people? Yeah, I, that, that's, a, I think, a great question to perhaps tie everything together here. And it really is all about creating a system. And this includes putting together those regulatory pieces that everybody hates, such as KYC, in a way and in a wrapper that just can be done without much ah, friction, I guess you could say. So we're we're integrated with a company called SumSub for KYC. And right now, from what we're seeing in our statistics, it takes about five minutes for a user to join the mm-hmm. platform than to be actually fully verified. This is you know identity verification, all of that fun stuff. Again, what we try to do is we are staying within our boundaries for compliance, but essentially creating a process that allows as quick of a transition from you know potential clients to onboarded individual and transacting as we possibly can. For our UX and UI, again, simplicity is really the key here. And we're not going to try to say that we are some huge company that uh, can, can spend millions of dollars in R&D and A-B testing. But what we can say is that we are starting small and we're starting very, very basic and we're going to build from there. Part of that is listening to what the consumer has to say and what our users have to say, what they like, what they don't like. That type of communication, I think, is critical. So if anybody ever Mm -hmm. wants to get into touch with us, if they had any comments or concerns, there's very quick and easy ways to interact with us and be able to get a response very, very quickly. So that applies for the retail side of what we're doing and especially for the concierge where it's you know a one-on-one agent that you're dealing with 24-7, 365, that you have access to not only mm-hmm. from a trading uh, initiative perspective, but also from a knowledge perspective. And as we continue to move forward, what we want to try to do is we want to capture feature sets and products that really help a broad range of individuals in the space, uh, chief among which right now is the volatility isn't very high and there are perhaps not many news coming out other than China this, China that. (laughs) Uh, The market is pretty slow. So (laughs) you're going to have somebody that might not get too excited about Bitcoin to want to take that first plunge. However, this is the time to be the most active. This is the time where you want to, for example, dollar cost average. Mm -hmm. Right. So creating a product that fits this type of mindset and framework that allows people to essentially invest on autopilot, if you will, is one of the key ways that we're trying to position ourselves as we move forward is taking these types of, Mm. I don't want to say unique offerings because they're, they're not, but putting them in a package where it's accessible quick and you're able to onboard yourself into the ecosystem, not just Bitcoin reserve, but Bitcoin in general uh, within a flash. 
Mm. Yeah, that's that's key. I mean, this is absolute stacker's paradise. And yes. like you said, people won't see or realize it. Um, and a, a couple of years from now, people are going to look back and go, oh, my God, imagine if I could buy at these prices. Oh, that would have been nice. And <laughs> uh, yeah, it it is just such a good time to be getting in. It really, I mean, I, I've, <laughs> I don't know if Nish told you, I've literally just sold my home to stack because... Um, I was just like, this is this is just I, ca- I cannot I cannot do anything else. I have to get rid of the house. So I'm living out of cardboard boxes now so that I can stack because I am that confident on this thing. And dollar cost averaging is the way that I tend to do it because I don't think I'm smart enough to try and trade or try and time the markets. It's just buy every day and stack it away. And I think for most people, just that that way to just be able to have something set up and know that you're just constantly trickling money into this thing. It gives you peace of mind. You don't have to be worrying. You don't have to look at the price all the time. And it frees up your brain to actually research and and learn what this thing is capable of and and the tools around it rather than constantly trading. Because that's what I used to do when I first came in. I thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to be able to trade this thing. And it's it's just going to wreck you. People just get absolutely wrecked. I mean, there's probably a small percentage of people who who do okay, but uh, it certainly wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, trading is one of those things where it's a profession, and uh, unless you decide to mm. go down that particular rabbit hole, you are doing yourself a disservice trying to time the market. And mm. one thing that I will say with regards to DCA is that DCA is not for every single asset out there. DCA has a very specific definition when it comes to specifically trading and investing. You should only dollar cost average into an asset class that consistently goes up over time, historically. In this case, Mm -hmm. Bitcoin, as we know, is deflationary, so it matches that perfectly. But for example, I know people that are like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm stacking this shitcoin, I'm stacking that. It's like, no, 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 that's... That's, that's wrong because those eventually go to zero. You're just buying in at a higher price every single time over a long period of time. That serves you no value. Um, but some people they 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 just don't get it. They they see the you know the kind of the quick gains in the market and they they have a very high time preference. And hmm. I guess you, you can't change everybody. But if there's only one thing to take away from Bitcoin that I have personally, is it has completely changed my perspective with regards to time preference. I was always get that money, make it quick, and then I can coast. No, that's Mm -hmm. just very, very rare outside of winning the lottery or some other type of uh, rare financial event, windfall income, as they call it. That just isn't realistic. You take Mm -hmm what you create in this world, in this earth, and then you make sure that a portion of that effort goes to continually securing wealth. And wealth, in my opinion, it's not just Bitcoin. It's fresh and good access to food, water, Mm. air. That is what's also going to allow you to live for a very, very long time, not just your financial wealth. And Bitcoin allowed me to think about all that. It's like, okay, well, now I'm starting to think about what truly wealth means to me and once you take that perspective and you realize that the time horizon is really what's important to focus on it it changes your outlook on life that is such a good point that you've hit on there this idea of uh, you know thinking about all the aspects of your life and and true wealth as you as you so rightly said is is not just about money it's time and 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 being able to spend time with your your family and your friends and have good food and have experiences and yeah it's um it's amazing how bitcoin opens people's eyes to this it's amazing how people begin to think about what's truly important and i think a lot of it is just taking that step back it's just taking a step back and thinking about the way that we go through life and and the the thing is once you realize that this is going to be around probably forever and that it's that you're you're able to actually put your value into something and it's not going to melt away you start thinking well, I do want to look after my body. I do want to make sure that I'm going to be around for a long time. I do want to make sure that my family are not eating fiat food. They're eating real good quality stuff yeah. because the further down the rabbit hole you go, you go, well, hold on. 
They lied to me about the money. They lied about education. They lied about food. They've lied about everything. So where's the truth? And then you go searching for that truth and you realize I could do so much better than I have been. I could really make my life better. And um, it's an exciting journey. And there are so many other Bitcoiners with so much knowledge who are happy to share it that it's just like uh, it's, it's the perfect classroom. <laughs> like Bitcoin, Twitter, especially is like the perfect classroom for this. Yeah, I mean, you, you said it. Bitcoins opens you up to life, really, to what life really can be for yourself. Hi, Nick, you there? Yes, I am. Okay, all right. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. It keeps just showing you it was offline, like constantly. And then I get, it, it goes through patches. Sometimes I get sort of 80, 90%, but sometimes 30% of what you're saying. And so um, I, I don't I have no idea what's happening there. I'm also sat on the router. Yeah, that's very strange. Hopefully the platform itself is able to capture everything. It will do. Yes, this is why I use this is because it records everything locally. Then I sort of patch it together afterwards and really? it sounds fine, but but it's just it's difficult to get all of it. So we were just talking about outside of financial wealth and, and being able to learn about these other important aspects. Yeah, that's right. And I, I truly feel that Bitcoin opens you up to really evaluating your life for what it can be. And that's not just a nine to five. That's not just waking up, trying to make money that is going to disappear, whether on a consumerist type of lifestyle or whether it's going to disappear through other means that are uncontrollable to your own, such as uh, monetary inflation. Um, it allows you to refocus, really, and build something that's truly going to stand the test of time. Your family, your legacy, your businesses, and it's truly a future that I, I want to be in. Hmm. Is there any particular rabbit hole that uh, you've gone down since Bitcoin, you know, uh, like health wise or <laughs> yeah, travel wise yeah, or, or yeah. something that's really changed? Yes, uh, there's several. Um, first and foremost, it's the nutritional aspect. I realized a fair bit ago, even before Bitcoin, that it was critically important to understand what one puts inside their body, but I didn't understand how grossly misrepresented the entire commercial food system is and the education on what nutrition truly is. And one of my rabbit holes that I went down into was exploring what does nutrition actually mean? And I'll, I'll save everybody the journey because it is a very long yet interesting one. I settled on carnivore. Um, and this is also oh, part of my <laughs> man. <laughs> the Bitcoin community, I'm sure as you know, and our, and our listeners here today. But I, I have not felt so good in my entire life. I mean, I, I grew up uh, living on fast food. You know, hey, parents didn't have time to make a lunch for you. Go grab some McDonald's. Go grab some Wendy's. Go grab some Taco Bell. And I thought I was okay. I, I, I felt I, what I thought at that time was fine. But ever since I started to focus on true nutrition and understanding not just, hey, put meat and put fat into your body, but what kind of meat, how is it raised, what is going into its body that is eventually making its way into its cellular structure and eventually into mine. And then when I started to really mm. dive deeper onto the sources of my food and what type of food I ate, that was another big aha moment in my life. And my wife joined me, luckily, for the journey, and we haven't looked back since. So we've been the healthiest that we've ever been in our entire life, frankly. It's amazing how many people are finding this. It seems that the two the two big themes there are people in in Bitcoin are fasting and going carnivore. Mm -hmm. Are you doing both, or 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 are you yeah, so just carnivore? I do, yeah, I do. Uh, I do intermittent fasting. Um, actually, it's OMAD. Uh, Mm -hmm. technically could be considered intermittent fasting, but that added with cold exposure. I don't know if you're familiar with Wim Hof at all, but that has elevated. I am, but I'm such a pussy. I'm such oh. a pussy. <laughs> don't, don't, just don't do it in the shower. The shower is the <laughs> hardest thing ever to do. Do it in an open body of water that has to be at Isn't least it? eight degrees, because I feel that if the water is 10, 11, 12 degrees Celsius, 
sorry for all you Fahrenheit guys, not going to happen here for the conversion. Um, but if that water is in that range, you're just cold enough to be uncomfortable, <laughs> but you're just mm -hmm. warm enough for your bodies not to naturally kick in all of the brown adipose tissue and every other chemical process that happens in really cold water. So if you're trying it for yourself, I highly mm. suggest that you go to a really cold body of water, not shower, get your entire body up to your neck and ideally right up to your jugular vein covered and you will feel that it's so much easier. That's all I'll say. <laughs> uh, that's the trick then. Yeah, because I've been trying I've been trying it in the shower and it's just like the Brilliant. most horrible thing and yeah it's it's just horrible like yeah. i can train in a horrible way where i'm you just absolutely go balls to the wall i can do that i can go through a lot of pain i can do certain things but when it comes to that i don't know what it is i end up just like running out the shower basically because it's so fucking cold <laughs> but yeah uh, yeah i'll yeah. give that a go i'll definitely <laughs> give that a go it just doesn't hit the right spots all at the right time yeah, that's it. And then, yeah, the, the sort of combining that with the intermittent fasting is definitely something that I've, I've personally found has helped. I've not gone full carnivore yet. I've tend to do like mainly meat and fish, but I'll have like broccoli or spinach or, you know, whatever. I have like certain vegetables with it. But uh, I keep getting told that that is not the way to go. Like, what's your thoughts on that? Like, wh why? Yeah, that's interesting. With, with the yeah, uh, I mean, we've ran the gamut and kind of experimented with different types of uh, fruits at the very beginning, you know, uh, before learning the concept of sugar and its toxicity, and then vegetables. But then eventually we started mm -hmm. to get into research where specifically the human gut microbiome, and it's very specific to every individual, might I add, is not very adept at breaking down the cellulose structure within the vegetables. So even though those vegetables are nutritionally dense in vitamins, those are not body soluble vitamins. And if you do consume a lot of vegetables, you need to absolutely need to consume fat as well, because that's the only way that you're going mm -hmm. to able to even extract five, two, six, seven, whatever percent it is of the nutritional content of those vegetables. And the issue for me personally is I, for whatever reason, have not evolved the proper gut microbiome to eat lots of veggies. I mean, for sorry for the graphic nature of this, but it looks like a salad bowl, you know, <laughs> after I'm done going to the restroom sometimes if I had a really, <laughs> really green meal. And that completely was eliminated when I started focusing on getting my vitamins and nutrition from meat. And by the way, it's not just like, hey, I'm going to go grab mm. a T-bone. No, it's organ meat. It's liver. You have to take that into consideration. And that's where the majority of your nutrients are going to come from. And when you have that, you don't, I, I don't miss vegetables whatsoever. Uh, and so are you going to specific butchers or places to make sure, you know, you're talking about, yes. well, I'm eating this animal. Well, what did this animal eat? If the animal's eating a load of shit, then it's not going to be so good for you to eat. So how do you, especially if you're traveling around, how do you find places where you know that the meat is good quality? And that is very, very tough, especially when you're transiting from one place to another. I thankfully have my wife who is uh, very sociable. So she'll go into mm -hmm. a farmer's market and just start chatting it up and talking with people and asking, mm -hmm. oh, how does this happen? And where did you do this? And so on and so forth. That's I'm not that kind of person. I just have a difficult time doing that with uh, with strangers, perhaps. Uh, but uh, she's the one that has allowed me to be able to connect with those types of individuals, and she'll drill down on pretty much, hey, what's 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 the cow's name? Is it Betsy that we're going to be having? <laughs> Where does she live? Is she <laughs> is it grain fed, grain finished, grain fed, grass fed, grass finished? All together, all of those elements. Where is the farm located? Oh, you know, what's what's the ecology there? Like, what's the weather? And she'll do that everywhere we go. Right. She'll mm -hmm. try her best in, in different languages if that happens to be the case. But uh, I'm very happy to have her in my life to do that for me. Otherwise, I'd be kind of shit out of luck. Mm -hmm. I'd probably be trying to get a bow and arrow and on my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to find where to go. It's a journey I'm on at the moment as well, just like making sure you get the best quality. And it's so expensive as well. Like to eat well 
is very very expensive i'm trying to find ways to like split with people say like oh you know i'll go in uh, and, and share a cow with you and yep. uh, you know freeze it and do something like that and because totally. more and more people are going this way um are you familiar with uh, untapped growth or nunya no I, i'm not familiar with that concept. oh my god you have to you you have to check them out i'll, I'll give you some info offline Please. but yeah they're, they're doing some pretty amazing stuff around around this um but yeah it's 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 so important well listen i, I because we're having these technical issues i could sit and chat to you all day this has been really interesting conversation it's um been very wide ranging and it's been cool to get to know you and and, and find out a little bit of the personal side of of you and and why it is that you formed the business and it sounds like it is a fantastic business I, I really look forward to trying it out but i i wanted to give a little bit of time if if there was anything that we hadn't covered to uh, to go through and and for people to find out about bitcoin reserve and and where they go and and how they use it yeah, go to www.bitcoinreserve.com and it's pretty self-explanatory. We have both products available there for you. One is Flash Trade, which is the automated purchase option, and then Concierge if you're dealing with anything over $50,000. You'd like to be have a direct connection with one of our agents. After that, the onboarding process is fairly simple for both routes. I think where I would like to leave off from the business perspective is we are the type of people, Yuri and myself and the rest of the team, uh, that are very much aware of what is currently going on in the world around us. And as a result, we're trying to build for that world. So while we might be a little bit slow on the uptake, uh, rest assured that it's for a reason. <laughs> and that reason is that so we can make specifically what we believe is going to be helpful and valuable to the people that are going to be using our products in the future. Very cool. Well. Like I said, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you and getting to know you. I'd really like to get you on again. There are a few things that I wanted to get into, like the uh, macroeconomic side of, of what's going on and, and all the crazy stuff that we're seeing in the world. I'd love to know more about uh, the diet side and uh, all those kind of things, but I feel I wouldn't do it justice with, with the connection issues. So um, yeah, it, it would be great to do something again, but thank you so much for coming on and uh, yeah, open door policy anytime. Uh, come on and have a chat with me. I've really enjoyed it. It was my pleasure, Max, and I look forward to those future conversations. I think there's a treasure trove of things that can be discussed between you and I. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. All right then, mate. Nice to speak to you. Take care. You as well.